Christian. But in the busy body sense, it's not your business. Paul says, hey, mind your own business. There are Christians in the church in Thessalonica who are getting into everybody else's business instead of minding their own. Now, this is not just don't, this isn't just mind your own business or don't stick your nose in other people's business. He actually says, mind your own. Take care of yours. If you have people in your life that are trying to mind your business, that is the dead giveaway. They're not minding theirs. You can only mind one store at a time. And that's kind of the language here. It's kind of that storekeeper. Hey, mind the store. Mind your own store. Let me give some practical ways what that might look like for us, okay? Maybe challenge you. <clears throat> Focus on what God wants you to do, not what you think others should do. Let your own spirit, this is this one stepped on my toes. Are you ready? I even wrote it and it hurt me. Let your own spiritual immaturity concern and frustrate you more than their spiritual immaturity. Mind your own business. And good things come as a result. The third thing in there, work with your hands. Now we have to understand this. This isn't this isn't against white collar work. That's not what it's saying. If you work at a computer, you know, you know, I guess technically you're still working with your hands, right? But it's not a literal thing. The idea here is especially in the Greek uh, culture of that time, the Greeks were, you know, they think about what's happening outside of scripture. Remember, real time, real places, historical things going on in addition to what we see in scripture, okay? And and so this is this is Greek culture. So this is about thinking and thought and philosophers. And, and so for them, you know, working with their hands, that was kind of beneath them. They had servants and they had slaves that did, you know, work with their hands. I'm too busy doing, you know, thoughtful, philosophical things because I'm a Greek and, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So you have to understand what Paul says, hey, it's, it's an idea of humility. It's an idea of humility. Don't be too good to, to do the simple things. That, that's really what I see. I, I wanted to share, uh, even in, in, in our world, um, there's kind of a thing called the simplicity movement. I'd encourage you to Google that, okay? And there's a lot of stuff out there, and it, it, some of it goes overboard, and I, I know I think that kind of stuff, but the whole idea is you can simplify your life by how you live, that many of the problems and stresses that we live and have to tolerate in our life, we actually invite because of how we choose to live in a consumeristic society. And so this idea of just simplifying, I'm going to simplify my, my automobiles, my house, my wardrobe, my work situation, make it simple again. I think we, were, we thrive, we thrive, we're created to kind of live in a simple, in a simple place and we've made it so complicated. So the idea here is, hey, don't, don't be too good. Live a life of humility and simplicity that might include working with your hands. I, I think this is true. Those of us who, who don't get paid to work with our hands, there's still something to that, isn't there? There's something about working with metal or with, with wood carving or with painting or, or, or you know, pulling weeds in the garden. You know, there, there's something kind of zen about it. You know, you get your music going, you're pulling weeds and you see, you know, and there's something, there's something about that, that working with your hands, it seems that, yeah, it's like we're supposed to, it kind of fits us somewhere. The second thing here is that some people in the church of Thessalonica had, had uh, they, they were so uh, in belief that Jesus was gonna come back any minute, literally just sort of, oh, he didn't come back today, it must be tomorrow, <clears throat> that they weren't working. They had quit their jobs, they were living on, that's why the second part of this, not only get to gain respect to the outsiders, you also won't be dependent on anyone. That's what it was. They had quit their job and said, all right, you know, I'm just be lazy because Jesus is coming back tomorrow. Oh, no, okay, well, maybe the next tomorrow. And so what he's saying also is not only be humble, he's be, move towards simplicity and quiet, a quiet life. He's also saying, you know what? Work to be a giver, not a taker. Christians, I'm not talking about seasons of your life. I'm not saying don't be a receiver. We have to be a receiver, many of us, ultimately spiritually, sometimes even financially and supported, and that's probably why we, we even do that for each other here as, as, a, as a community, as a family. But the idea that ultimately a Christian does not glorify God by being a taker, he, he, glor he or she glorifies God by being a giver. Other places in scripture, it's actually told, you know what, if, if, if you've been stealing, this is, the, this is the admonition, this is the teaching of someone who used to be a thief, if you've been stealing things, if you're a thief, well quit stealing, but he doesn't stop there. The teacher says, you know what? Don't just quit stealing, but get a job and work so that you can be a giver. Quit being a taker, but you're not done. That's only halfway. Get to where you can be a giver out of resources. We saying, hey, live a simple life, but also go to where you're not dependent on anyone. You can become a giver, not a taker. So three things here. Make it your goal to lead a quiet life. 
mind your own business, and work with your hands. And you will gain the respect of those on the outside, and you won't be dependent on anyone. I think sometimes, and I'm probably in this boat with some of you, you know, it's, it's interesting to talk about kind of theoretical concepts and, and, and kind of lofty spiritual ideas, and, and, and I, I think that's important. I think from that we, we, we get our practical things we need to do to practice in life. But I love whenever Paul just jumps in right here. Now, now keep in mind, we're in chapter 40. He spent the first three chapters reminding them about Jesus and Jesus and Jesus and how what God has done for us and et cetera, et cetera. But then he goes to the very practical parts. What Paul always does in all of his letters, he, he's, he ask him a question, how should we deal with this? Is a problem they're dealing with? And, and Paul always brings them back saying, well, first let's talk about Jesus. And then he says, all right, now, what was your question? Let's try to apply Jesus to your question. If drama is in your life, these are three steps that very practically start moving you toward throwing drama from the train, dropping the drama in your life. If we keep working at loving each other, that's the whole section right up above this, people in the church, they love each other. It talks about sexual immorality there as well, saying that's not what loving each other looks like. Love each other. And if we'll keep working to love each other, we'll keep working to be a quiet people, We'll be taking care of our own business, and we work to get to be givers, not takers, then we please God. But there are even earthly results, the respect of outsiders, and you won't be dependent. So there's even a security and a respect that comes in this earthly life. So let me come, let me bring it back to drama, all right? Because I think that's where so many of us live. If your life is constantly in drama, you can get freed and healed of that. God loves you so much, he's given some instructions to, to help you get out of that situation. Now, what does that look like? I'm going to be real careful. Again, for time's sake, won't be too specific, but some of that's going to be, if it's all a result of sin, either your own sin, obviously the implication there is, is there, wrestle with that, share that with God, ask him to remove that, ask him to further sanctify you. Maybe you need some, maybe you need not just the vertical help, you need some some horizontal help, and where you're saying, hey, I'm going to ask someone up to pray with me or hold me accountable or give me some advice. I keep trying to get rid of this thing. But, oh, this is the way the drama keeps finding me in my own sin. You know, here we're not going to condemn you. We're going to support you. We're going to encourage you in that. All right? The second thing is going to be that whenever you also can remove sin that's affecting you through other people. Now, I want to be real careful because it, it, it depends. It depends. Well, I'm trying to reach them for Jesus. Well, you know what? Get busy then. Get busy. Let's, let's find out if, if God's working with them or if it's just you. Because if you're not careful, you're even warned. Be careful lest you stumble. Because at some point, it is like, hey, you know what? That's not healthy for me. That is not of God. Drama keeps finding me through person X or person Y. Now, it's different if you covenanted with that person in marriage, okay, that we got to struggle more. That's why I'm being real careful with exactly how to play that out and when you do those things and, you know, that kind of thing. But, but I'm talking about the people that, that you run with. Is it constant drama? Is it constant drain? Or is it shower? Is it, is it blessing on each other? Drama does not glorify God. Drama tempts you to sin. In drama, how patient and kind and gentle and loving and forgiving are you? Drama tears and wears you down. Don't do this just because God said. Do it because God said. And he says it for you as much as his own glory. So practical, the words of God. And you can go live a simple life and work with your hands and mind your own business and, and be outside of Christ. And you've helped your life, but you've not taken on the abundant life and the eternal life. That these are the things that come from God. And as Christians, that we're the ones who should be the exemplaries of this lifestyle. Because then, not only will we be receiving something, we have something that the world values that they'll be drawn to. Because we can tell them about, uh, you know, coming to church on Sunday morning. We can tell them about, 
uh, you know, things they need to do and not do. But if they're not in Christ, it's almost like they can't get that yet unless they come to the end of that because they've been burned by so much and looking for a different way to live, okay? That's a different conversation. But whenever we say, how come you're so peaceful and joyful? How come you be so loving and forgiving? How come you have this tranquility inside of you? How, how come, how, how do you avoid all the drama? How come you don't get involved in all the work, workplace stuff and, and all the relational stuff? And, and I don't hear you always just constantly complaining about you, you know, your spouse. And, and how, how do you do that? And he said, oh, I don't do that. God does that in me. And either they'll say, oh, no thanks. And then they're going to go back to their life of drama until they get worn out because it wears and tears until they get worn and torn. Or they're going to start being open saying, you know what? I don't know about all that Jesus stuff, but I know I want what you have. And if you're saying that's where you get it, help me understand that. Help me see that a little bit. So I want, I want, to, I want to let it let it land with full weight. At the same time, obviously, we started with a bit of levity as well, right? People, Christians, sons of God, daughters of God, children of the King, throw the drama from the train. It's one of the things I love here, that we come and we support each other and that, that we keep it relatively drama free, you know? In your lives, drop the drama because you, and you can. If you're not in Christ, if these are great principles and maybe you've been worn and torn and you're done and you're not looking just for a little fix to some stress and, and problems in your life, but if you've not ever put your faith in Jesus, then this is an opportunity to do that as well. Put these things into practice. Because if you don't, the Bible says you're like a fool who's building a house on sand. You've come and done the religious thing, check, check, check. But you're not going to go out and try and change your life with the truth that's been spoken. Throw drama from the train and you benefit and God is glorified. And there's more goodness that happens and grows in you. God bless you. Let's stand and uh, sing our song.